Call the court to order. All legal notices have been posted. A quorum is present. And this court is duly called. Can I get a motion to open the court? So second. Got a motion to second. Any unreadiness? <clears throat> All those in favor, let it be known by the usual sign of voting. Aye. Aye. Those who oppose, same sign. Chairs in the affirmative. Bailiff will open the court, please. All rise. The Dallas County Commissioner's Court is now in session for the month of January 2016. Term of the Honorable Commissioner John Wiley Price presiding. Please remain standing for the invocation. Thank you. This morning, our invitation will be given by a guest of Judge Jenkins. Um, I don't really need any. any um, I'll accept that it's not Judge Jenkins. It is. Is, is it yours? Okay, I'm sorry. I, for some reason, I thought it was Judge Jenkins. Okay, got it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Daniels. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much. And good morning to everybody on this morning. It is with great pride and humility that I invite the Reverend Dr. Ronald E. Jones to come forward as he is, first of all, a longtime friend. Indeed. A resident of Garland. The dedicated, committed servant of God is the 13th senior pastor of the historic New Hope Baptist Church. Dr. Jones is a devoted husband and the good uh, Mrs. Jones is here, uh, 48 years to his lovely wife, Dr. Peggy R. Jones. He is an honorable father of two sons. The eldest son, Ronald E. Jones II, is an attorney, and the youngest son is a retired NFL player uh, who played for the Giants, the Bears, and the Vikings. Daryl currently serves as director of youth at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship under the pastorship of Dr. Tony Evans, and he is working on his doctorate degree at Southwestern Theological Seminary. Mayor Jones and Peggy have seven adorable granddaughters and three grandsons, and we'll be hearing more later, later but first. All right, thank you, Dr. Uh, Daniel. To the, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal Father, we are always grateful for the opportunities and privileges you give us in life, especially for this opportunity to come before this governance body of the Dallas County, thanking you for the invitation to Dr. D from Dr. Daniel and the court in general. And God, in obedience with your command, we do pray for those in power. We pray for those in the seat of government. Knowing that no matter who sits there, whether they be heathen, whether they be believer, you control the hearts and minds of individuals, and you allow them to sit and make crucial decisions. So we pray your blessings upon this court, that they will have discernment, that they will have wisdom, that they will deliberate appropriately, that their decorum will always be proper. And that they will make wise decisions as every decision they make impact not only the lives of the citizens of this county, but it ripples around the nation in general. We thank you for their immediate response to the disaster of the hurricane that hit multiple cities in North Texas. Thank you for their involvement, for their continued coordination of the emergency cleanup and response to the, meeting the needs of our citizens. Bless them individually, bless them collectively. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you. <clears throat> Judge, if you, if you will, I hadn't had the occasion to just welcome everyone to this edition of the Commissioner's Court, but I would like for my colleagues, I think I sent a, um, a memo, a motion to uh, the Robert Roos to suspend the agenda as posted uh, in as much as Dr. Uh, Perkins uh, has to do. So we want to move the flu update up in the agenda, so I, I put a motion out there to suspend the agenda. Uh, there, there, second. There's a motion. All right, and there's a second. Um, all those in favor, see by saying aye. Aye. Uh, we can do it after resolutions. All right, and our uh, first resolution is, is on uh, Commissioner Daniel. Thank you very much. And now with the, uh, the good reverend, Jones, please come forward uh, with those I know who love and cherish him. Let me get my wife, Dr. Nair. Absolutely. 
And I make one statement, if I may, by permission of the court. Yes. Uh, this you July. Make all the statements you want to. All right. Thank you. <laughs> County Judge Jenkins, a good friend, uh, and my my representative from well, I got several representatives from Garland. Now, I thank all of you, uh, <laughs> friend, longtime friend, Commissioner Cantrell, uh, Dr. Daniels, and John Wally Price, longtime friend as well. Thank you for your representation of Garland. And if you may allow me, as a former mayor of Garland. Uh, you've served well and you consistently serve well. And in and before then. But this is my wife. As of July 2nd this year, we'll be married 50 years. Oh. Newly a director of Atron for Dart. Uh, serves under my good friend Jesse Oliver. Uh, John asked me if he could stand here. I said, You just a check with Teresa Daniel. Uh, and I'm on. I apologize. But John got it started in Garland, uh, working in the tax department. I had to approve his hiring back then when I was assistant city manager. And uh, he looked so young, he almost didn't well. iron. So he's done, uh, he, now you're our county tax assessor. So any success we claim, any uh, negative part about it, we, we went on straight. Thank you. I'm fine. <laughs> I thank you for this privilege. Now we will go back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> uh, and this is a resolution, whereas the Dallas County Commissioner's Court recognizes individuals who have made a significant contribution to the betterment of Dallas County. The Reverend Donnelly Jones has years of distinguished service to his religious, civic, and community endeavors. He is elected... He was elected the, the 13th senior pastor of historic New Hope Baptist Church on January 27, 2013, the oldest African-American church in Dallas, Texas, founded in 1873. And whereas Reverend E. Donald E. Jones served as interim pastor on four different occasions and in many capacities over his 45 years at New Hope Baptist Church. He served as associate pastor, professional Christian counselor, certified temperament counselor, certified mediator, experienced negotiator, and parliamentarian. He's also served as advisor to several churches. And whereas Reverend R. Ronald E. Jones spent 29 years with the city of Garland, five and a half years as the assistant city manager. He's a graduate of the first leadership Garland class. After his retirement in May 25, 2005, Reverend Dr. Ronald E. Jones served as management consultant to the city manager and helped set up a relief center for the victims of Hurricane Katrina. He also served as an adjunct professor of business for 10 years at El Central College in Dallas, Texas. And whereas in 2007, Reverend Jones was elected as the first African-American mayor of the city of Garland, the 11th largest city in Texas, and the 86th largest city in the nation. He served three consecutive terms as mayor with distinction. And whereas Reverend Jones is actively engaged with many Christian and civic organizations, including life member of the PTA and NAACP, National Christian Counselors Association, the National Association of Parliamentarians, Kiwanis Club of Garland, the Garland Asian American Task Force, Garland Chamber of Commerce, the Garland Summer Musicals, Garland Area Hispanic Affairs Association, the Garland Police Academy Alumni Association, and the Garland Landmark Society. Whereas while Mayor of Garland, Reverend Jones served on the Regional Transportation Council Board, North Texas Commission Board of Directors, the U.S. Conference of Mayors Transportation Committee, and International Affairs Committee, the UTD Institute of Public Affairs Advisory Council, the Metroplex Mayor's past president, Economic Development Steering Committee, and Luna Elementary School Campus Improvement Team. We're almost done. Not quite, though, as he is not. Thank you. Whereas Reverend Jones is the recipient of numerous honors and awards throughout his career, including inducted into the Elite News Minister's Hall of Fame, the South Dallas Business and Professional Women's Trailblazer Award, uh, Maureen Bailey uh, Community Service Award, Man of the Year by the Texas Public Power Association Award, the Dallas Baptist University Distinguished Alumni Award, and the Garland Chamber of Commerce Tall Texan Award. Whereas the Dallas Historical Society honored Reverend Jones with the Excellence in Humanities Award in their 2015 Award for Excellence 
and community service gala most benefiting. And whereas a graduate of James Madison High School in Dallas, Texas in 1962, Reverend Jones earned his baccalaureate degree from a Dallas Baptist University, a Master's of Science degree in Human Relations and Business Management from Abilene Christian University, and a doctorate degree in Clinical Christian Counseling from Cornerstone University. Now therefore, be it resolved on behalf of the Dallas County Commissioner's Court, the residents of Garland and of Dallas County, we humbly thank Reverend Donald Jones for his selfless dedication to improving the lives of <coughs> everyday citizens through his spiritual leadership, passion, and vision of a better Dallas County. And I so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you very much, and I remain at your service. And you call on me. Thank you. <laughs> and we do, as you know. We do know. Commissioners, if I may say a few words real quick about Ron Jones. Um, I was 19 years old when Ron Jones said, yeah, let this young man come work for us at the city of Garland. Uh, many of the management practices that I use today are derived directly from Ron Jones' leadership and what I've learned from him. But I want to tell a very quick story. About a year after I came to the City of Garland Tax Office, my boss, Carol Clark, the tax assessor, was out of town. We had a customer that was very disgruntled that they had to pay penalties and interest because they were late, and they asked to meet with Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones met with the young lady. He came out, and he said, I've gone ahead and waived all those penalties and interest. <laughs> so at that time, I had to afford my boss's boss that he did not have the authority to do what he had done. <laughs> he did it very well. He pulled money out of his pocket, paid the penalties and interest, and we went on about our day. So and that's the kind of man Ron Jones is. All right, he said right. that. But my, his boss, Carol Clark, the former tax assessor, said, Ron, I'm trying to keep you out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, All right, and our next resolution uh, is okay. from Commissioner Price. <clears throat> Judge, uh, this morning we're very pleased to have uh, former City Councilman uh, Grady Smithy and his delegation to come forward. Got my mayor of Duncanville, look like the real. Um, boss of the Grady Smithy household is here, Miss yeah. Smithy. And yeah. So, uh, this resolution reads: <clears throat> Whereas Grady W. Smithy Jr. is widely known as a perpetual ambassador and chief advocate of Duncanville, Texas, who admittedly wants that the only time. He's ever lived away from Duncanville was the year he spent on Capitol Hill. And whereas Grady W. Smithy Jr. has served several terms as councilman in the city of Duncanville for more than 20 years and is regarded as an elder statesman and an excellent resource for anyone who wants to know anything about the city of Duncanville or transportation. And whereas Gordy W. Smith Jr. has been a fearless warrior and the lone voice at times of an original founder of the Dallas Regional Mobility Coalition, which set in operation in 1990. And whereas Gordy W. Smith Jr. was appointed by then Governor Rick Perry to the special study group on private participation in toll projects and distinguished himself as an outstanding visionary on the Dallas Regional Mobility Coalition whose mission is to align the transportation strategies of five county regions which include Dallas, Denton, Collin, Rockwall, and Ellis. And whereas Grady W. Smith Jr has been pivotal in emerging issues involving roads and transportation for almost every major project such as Loop 9, State Highway 183 and the connectors, as well as developing policy matters such as revamping the state of Texas registration and inspection process. Therefore, 
be it resolved that the Dallas County Commissioner's Court with great admiration and respect laud and congratulate Grady W. Smithy Jr. for the successful service that he has invested in the DRMC for 26 years where in 22 of those years he held the post and served as its secretary and be it further resolved that his courage and willingness to fight to make a significant difference in the southern sector of Dallas County be used as a measure of all duly elected officials at the local, state, and national level, and I so move. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion <coughs> carries unanimously. Council. Thank you so much. I uh, greatly appreciate this. I, but I got to tell you, I couldn't have done anything that I've done without the Dallas County support. The support that's come, that came in the past from, from <coughs> county commissioners and county, and county judges, uh, county, county judge, uh, <coughs> you, you know, Lee Jackson is the one that started the Dallas County Coalition, you know, Mobility Coalition, and asked me to be, you know, one of the founding members. Uh, he also appointed me once I, once I ran against a mayor, you know, he ran for mayor in Dunkville against a banker who'd loaned everybody in town money, including me, and lost. <laughs> he, he put me on as county representative in, in 1994, and I greatly appreciate that. And his, and his lasting contribution, one of his lasting contributions to us, frankly, was whenever he let us have four cities clustered together to go out in, at COG. And, and we, 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 start, we had the first cluster city representation, and the mayors have selected me to, to do that. And I ended up doing 13 years of service on COG. And, and, and that's, that was really key because in southern Dallas County, as you very well know, Commissioner Price, we just didn't have anybody at the table. And if you don't have anybody at the table, you, you're not part of the discussion, and you can't get anything, anything done. And I, you know, it's been it's been my pleasure to work, you know, closely, you know, with with county commissioners, uh, you know, all, all the way back to Chris Seamus, and and, and, I, and I really appreciated what he did, and the and the way the county has has helped, it's the cities that were willing to to tax themselves and come up with money to match what you what you had is what really made Duncanville what you know, system what it is today. And I want to thank my wife for 51 years for putting up with me all this time Ooh. and coming to the city. <laughs> My tire was on straight, and my collar buttons were buttoned, and you know, and, and I was prepared. And I want to thank my, my mayor, David Green, who, frankly, of all the mayors, I work with five different mayors in Dunkville, and I have to say this proudly: I think he's the best mayor that we ever had. And again, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Appreciate it very much. Mayor, did you have anything you want to opinion? Brady is a real close personal friend. If people in Southwest County only knew what, how he battled, <coughs> how hard he battled. To make sure that we get our fair share, he has brought millions of dollars to Southwest Dallas County. I told Grady uh, once he got, once I got on the council, that my whole objective was to make him a kinder, gentler person, and that I had failed miserably. <laughs> but he is a great, great gentleman and fought hard for everything that we've got. Thank you, Grady. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mayor. Judge, before you move on, I'd just like to say that that uh, the last two resolutions, mm -hmm. clearly both of you, Grady and, and Ron, both of y'all are just incredible ambassadors for the cities that y'all represented over all those years and, and, and the support that you had and your wives that stood, stood beside you. Uh, every city uh, should have an ambassador like y'all. So thank y'all for what y'all do. Yeah. I just wanted to make the observation, too, along the same lines as, as my colleague, Commissioner Cantrell, in seeing just the leadership of the two of you and the fact that um, you make our job so much easier in that partnership between uh, the cities and the county. Yes, we are really able to accomplish more. So, I mean, the, it just, you know, gladdens my heart to know and to have known both of you for a good number of years um, and just you know working together and seeing what we can do to make things better here so it is it is just with very humbling but also with great joy to to see both of you here this morning and i just want to close by saying you know that it's been a pleasure working with both of you and of course you know the fact that the time people sometimes 
do not realize the amount of time that the service takes. And, you know, when you do that service, you know, I'm so glad that you're getting recognized because it's a small part of how much as a public servant we appreciate <coughs> the time that you and your families, and I've been the wife of a city council member, and trust me, that's why the Lord put me here then, so he could, he could know it too. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I know, I know how much you sacrifice to be your citizens <coughs> and your county representatives. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to. Um, I'm the chair. That means I, I, I can get the last word sometimes, and I, I want to just say, uh, give a, 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 a couple of vignettes, one about each of you that kind of illustrates to me what uh, uh, you've done as leaders. Uh, coming on as county judge, uh, Grady went to great lengths to to uh, give me the history of everything that had happened in uh, the southern part of the county. Uh, the struggles with Loop 9, the fact that it had been um, on the drawing board since 1955, um, helped me to understand the importance of opening up that land um, and why that needed to be uh, moved back onto our mobility plan. Uh, fought for Southern Dallas County, all, all of, of the Metroplex, but particularly as a voice for uh, Southern Dallas County on the DRMC um, ever since it was uh, founded. Uh, at times was a voice in the wilderness as people tried to move all the money to uh, counties north of us, uh, but was a consistent voice, um, and his work is now paying off. Uh, ne next week, I go down to Austin to accept $425 million from the state, and about 400 of that um, will be placed south of I-30 on the Southern Gateway. Um, and so that that work that he that he tilled, <coughs> those fills that he tilled, those are beginning to bear uh, great fruit because of of uh, his work. It's one of those unfair things in politics that you work so hard, and then somebody else is there to cut the ribbon. But um, Grady, I appreciate that. And Ron, the the thing that I always think about the most when I think about leadership um, and you is. When we had the West Nile virus crisis and we called on the spring, of course, I can ask for planes to come and I can um, declare a state of an emergency, but if the cities don't take us up on the offer, then more people die and, and we drive around at five miles an hour and try to spray with <coughs> trucks. Um, and it was a tough call because you remember at the time there was a public outcry. It's going to kill all the dogs and cats. It's going to kill all the bees. We're all going to get cancer. Um, and you stepped up. Yeah, Mayor Rawling stepped up, but he was in another, I think he was at Turks and Caicos or somewhere out of town, out of the country. Took him a, about a day and a half to get back. You were the first mayor to step up and say, I'm going to partner. We're going to make this happen. We're going to protect our citizens. You and the, I think a couple of Park City's mayors. And that really gave the other mayors the, the leadership um, to do that. And as a result of your work, the, the truck spraying was able to work in the cities that didn't want that because there was enough trucks for those cities then to cover those cities. And the, the aerial, of course, you know, we now know worked very well um, and didn't kill any cats or dogs or bees that we could tell. So I appreciate um, your leadership in that because in hindsight, of course, it's easy to see what the right call is on certain things, but in the fog of of the situation sometimes it's very hard and your leadership was you know most appreciated and thank you all right and uh, our last resolution is dr garcia thank you uh judge colleagues members of the audience uh this resolution is going to be read at a later date but it's a resolution that i want to move forward is uh, the League of Women Voters is celebrating their 20th year anniversary at the annual Susan B. Anthony Award Luncheon on February 11. And the person that will be recognized this year is no other than Regina Montoya Collins. As probably most of you know, someone very involved in the community, someone with a track record of helping, as well as being an ambassador for Dallas County and the city of Dallas. So I just want to move it. Uh, like I say, it will be read at a later date. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carries unanimously.
believe that is our last resolution. So at this time, we've had a motion to suspend the rules. Uh, so before we handle our consent agenda uh, with the uh, Health and Human Services Department, Please come forward with their information real, update. Real short, we just want to give a quick update. Dr. Perkins has a conference call he needs to get back to. Uh, Ryan, thank you. Let's go to the next slide, the flu update. Uh, we're going to skip to the second slide so Dr. Perkins can just go through right there. And get done. Thank you, Director Thompson. Uh, in regards to, uh, by the way, good morning, uh, Commissioner's Court, citizens of Dallas County. Uh, we're in the midst of our 2015 2016 flu season. And I'm very pleased to say that this season has been relatively quiet or mild compared to um, more recent uh, flu seasons, such as uh, last season and year before last. Uh, in regards to deaths, fortunately we have no deaths and our citizens have been reported to us for the medical community <coughs> and as far as adults and uh, pediatric uh, citizens. Uh, however, we are seeing flu virus circulating in our community and that's been illustrated by the fact that we have more positive confirms clin clinical specimens from citizens with flu-like illnesses. Next slide. So the recommendations are consistent year to year. The best way to protect yourself from the flu is to get the flu vaccine. In citizens six months and older is recommended. Use flu and cold etiquette in regards to washing your hands often with soap and water, preferably if not just hand sanitizer, cough into your into a, a napkin sleeve of some sort and by all means if you become symptomatic with flu-like illness then it's, it's in your best interest to seek medical care and you might be a candidate for a medication that will shorten the length of your battle with the flu next slide one quick question doctor is it too late for people to get the flu vaccine now that it's January 19th I uh, know the flu season officially is October through May okay so and, and it's still free at Health and Human Services. And we got plenty, free. right? We publicized that clearly. It's, yeah. it's not too late. Well, we're going to go right to the uh, next slide. Uh, Dr. Perkins uh, needs to go over the CDC advisory real quick and just kind of highlight uh, that aspect at one page. In our neighbors to the south, being uh, Mexico, Central, South America, the Caribbean, there's a virus that originated in Africa called the Zika virus. It spread via mosquitoes. Uh, the CDC has been monitoring the situation. This particular virus has been in the Western Hemisphere since 2007. However, it did not become problematic until about a year ago. Uh, in regards to Brazil, which will be the host country for the Olympics this year, they have noticed a significant increase in births to uh, pregnant women where their children have what we call microcephaly, small head size in relationship to their peer group. So the CDC has put out an advisory to women that are considering becoming pregnant or are pregnant to avoid travel to certain areas where this virus is being spread via mosquitoes. So I just want to highlight that check with travel medicine. If, it, if it's a necessity, that's one thing, but if it's not a necessity, then take the precaution by avoiding the area. I'm talking to pregnant women or women that are considering becoming pregnant. And if you have to travel, that you definitely utilize personal protection as far as the four Ds. Is this a flu-like type of virus? Oh, yes. It's still it's related to uh, chikungunya and dengue, and it's going to be a, a milder uh, flu-like illness. However, it, there's a possibility that it can uh, incur uh, birth defects in uh, children. Uh, the relationship between Zika and chikungunya? It's spread by the same mosquitoes as far as the uh, uh, Egyptii and the Apopictus uh, mosquito species, the daytime mosquitoes. So we're recommending that uh, DEET is used or insect repellent that's approved by the EPA <coughs> or the CDC that is used all day, every day. Dr. Perkins, uh, obviously here it says, you know, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, and South America. Do we have a link from our website or uh, what do you recommend people that want to know more about this uh, to do it easier, faster? Right. The, the CDC has this uh, information posted as far as travel uh, recommendations. Uh, as far as our particular website, we can provide a link to uh, the ease that transition. If someone's looking for information, they go to our website and they, that'll send them on to the state as well as to uh, CDC. Okay. But this at the CDC, uh, www.ncdc.gov travel notices where people can find more information. 
And we'll follow up with Erica, our PIO over there, and we'll, we'll do a link this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perkins. Mr. Next, uh, next slide. We're going to go briefly. We talked about the tornado response, so we're not going to uh, recreate it. It was a number of lessons uh, learned. The, the next steps is a key point. Uh, we'll continue to build on a relationship with our response partners. Our MRC was involved in all of the shelter activities. Uh, some of us were at one shelter uh, almost all night, so some of us uh, still had caught up on our sleep. And so I want to thank the MRC volunteers who were at each one of the shelters who participated in the response effort. And then again, we're talking about uh, cross-training. I'm going to go to the next slide, which is our proposed 27 legislative agenda. Uh, one of the things that we realize as we get ready for 2017 legislative agenda is that we're hoping that uh, the commissioner's court uh, would consider there's a number of things that were identified in the tornado response and ongoing uh, issues as it relates to public health clinics. And so we're asking uh, from Dallas County Health and Human Services is that if the commissioner's court would consider as part of our proposal to recommend adding uh, to the legislative agenda, a proposed law to consider uh, disaster recovery centers, da uh, disaster centers, public health clinics, and any county sponsored senior center uh, to a list of premises prohibiting the carrying of handguns and other weapons. Uh, we, uh, we believe in the Second Amendment. That's not even an issue there. The question is in terms of our public health clinics, in terms of our disaster shelters, uh, I think there needs to be a discussion regarding uh, the open carry of guns in those facilities. So this is not to prohibit anyone from exercising their rights. It's just that in these particular locations, such as our public health clinics where children are, as well as in a disaster scenario where people are traumatized and now in a shelter and need uh, to kind of get their, their lives back together, um, the fact that you have an open carry scenario, uh, it did raise some pause during the last tornado uh, episode in North Texas that we had. Right now, under Section 46075, there are a number of, of locations that are prohibited uh, where handguns can be carried. And so we're asking for the court's consideration uh, in uh, adding, uh, and I'm going to be very adamant, I've not held back on public health clinics. I said that in the last legislative session, so that's not new. Uh, I think now we have to expand that to uh, public health clinics, senior centers, as well as disaster shelters. What is it? Okay. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> before we, are you done? Yeah. Yes. But before thank we, you very much. Thank you. Before we move away from the tornado, I do want to give you all an update on where we are uh, regarding uh, the, hopefully getting federal assistance. Um, uh, and and so here here's the status of that by way of background uh, some of the staff may know these numbers uh, know uh, most don't know the exact numbers but uh, there are two thresholds that must be met for a governmental entity to get a, a disaster declaration to get paid back for for things like debris removal the first is our county number which is 8.6 million in governmental entities being out money for the whole county um, for things that are public like debris removal we are far beyond that in fact dallas county as it stands this morning is about at 24 million for all of our our municipalities for things like debris removal police overtime and expenditures for public <coughs> entities however in order for a disaster declaration to be considered for what's called public assistance, the state must meet its threshold of just a shade under 36 million. We're not quite there to the state's 36 million. Although the tornado hit uh, counties like Kaufman County and Ellis County that are less densely populated, there are less houses that are affected, less debris to be removed, less. Um, police overtime because there's less police there um, and so we're not quite there however we continue to have teams that go out um, and look at new damages that are found because the teams can only look at the damages that are seen at the time and then new damages um, are discovered and so we continue to work on that there's another type of assistance and meeting either of these thresholds means there's a possibility to get the relief for both 
And the second type of threshold is called individual assistance. And this is assistance to a homeowner. And there are different thresholds for that dealing with small businesses, but the main one that we want to focus on is for renters and homeowners and people that are displaced from where they live. Um, it, it is pretty much a certainty. They, they, these rules are very squishy and they're not, there's not a hard and fast number on any of them. But if 800 dwellings in uh, a state um, are without insurance or underinsured, however underinsured is defined for that emergency and there's not a, not a percentage of insurance that defines that in the federal regulations, then the president has always uh, declared that. FEMA's always recommended it. The president's always declared it. If there are about 450-ish, then that's about as low as the president's ever declared. Currently, we have 1,400 structures that fall into the, the dwellings. This includes apartments, uh, units, and houses. About 1,400 of those in this state, the vast majority of which are in Dallas County, um, that have been either destroyed or major damaged. There's minor damage, moderate damage, major, and destroyed. And so we have 1,400. However, the state and FEMA are currently using the factor of 78% of those dwellings will be either uninsured or underinsured because it's hard to know exactly who has adequate insurance. That number, which is being debated and contested daily on conference calls, um, puts us at 308 homes for purposes of that declaration. So um, what it looks like at this point is that we are unlikely to reach the number for homes unless FEMA looks back. My argument and the reason I'm making this, I'm saying this publicly is because I hope there is a, it is somewhat reported publicly and I hope that um, our federal partners will uh, consider that. Um, you know, Dallas County is the hottest real estate market in uh, the country. Uh, it's right here in the middle of North Texas and many of these homes in Garland and Rowlett the people who live in those homes are doing their very best to make sure that they keep their homes insured. But what happens is they build their home for $100,000 10 years ago. And the taxes go up on the home, but the taxes don't truly capture all of the value of their home. And, and then their, their home is, is majorly damaged so that it needs a tremendous amount of work. Um, but the way the insurance policy works is they find themselves, or it's destroyed, and they find themselves underinsured because the home is now insured for $150,000, but you can't replace that home for $150,000. And so what I hope will happen is I hope that we will prevail and that FEMA will see that um, when a person is at a place with their insurance company where they're going to be out substantial money, thousands of dollars uh, beyond their insurance, that that's underinsured and that they'll count those homes. If they do that, particularly in Garland and Rowlett because of the age of the structures, I feel like that'll get us over that threshold. The other way we'll get over the threshold, which we continue to work on and hopefully we'll have an answer in the midpoint of this week, is it particularly in the city of Rowlett, as we go back and we look at this damage, um, if FEMA will and the state validate that this additional damage and these additional dollars are sufficient, then that will put us above the, uh, the, the number for the state. And I have assurances from the governor's office that they will very quickly sign the paperwork uh, and then we'll go to work. Um, FEMA will, as a matter of course, send that to the White House and we'll go to work trying to get uh, that declaration declared. So that's the latest of, of where we are. It is frustrating. I appreciate FEMA and TEDM's work on this and our, our county's work. It's frustrating that it's taking so long to get a answer for our citizens. I understand that everyone is working very hard and work through the holidays. 
but I think it is time for us to m get this moving and get an answer for our citizens. We've now waited um, for nearly a, um, a, well, ten days, less than 10 days shy of a month uh, to get this done. So it's time to, to get the, the information in the president and make a decision. The whole issue of, of <coughs> insurance is dwellings versus, versus land. I mean, there, 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 there is a big difference. Calculation. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Daryl uh, Thomas, our county auditor, has an introduction. Thank you, Judge. Uh, as a lot of you may know, uh, our account, long term accounts payable manager, uh, Gwen Johnson, retired last night. <coughs> and uh, we had to make a new selection. And I know a lot of the county depend on this position to make sure all of their payments are made in a timely fashion. And I want you to know who you will put a face with a name. Uh, we have Ms. Nishika Smith. Um, been with Dallas County four and a half years. She comes with, to us with a very diversified background. She has a master's in a business administration and accounting. Uh, she is our financial revenue projector. Uh, she has a wealth of experience and knowledge bringing to the AP, so we just want to put a face with that. And also, Connie Lopez, I know all of you know Connie, she's been around a long time. Uh, they're the new team that you should be contacting when you're looking for payments. Uh, we we'll just thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and before we go to the consent agenda, a uh, you know, quick update, if you don't have this already, just so you'll have it ready. Um, we'll be <coughs> pulling 32 and 35 completely as per staff. Right. All right. We'll be pulling 7 and 54 for separate votes. Right. Okay, you already got it. Great. Right. Thank you. Um, I know there's an amendment to, to the stuff I've got, so I want to make sure you get it. Okay. And there's oh. a speaker on 5 as well? Oh, and there, I'm sorry. And pull 5 because mm -hmm. let's do that too. Let's pull... So you'll be ready. We don't have to do it right now, but so you'll have it. Okay. Full five for a separate five, um, seven, and fifty-four vote seven. because we've got a speaker. Okay. okay. So pull five, seven, and fifty-four for okay. separate votes. Judge, I'm pulling uh, item fifty-four in its entirety. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And we're pulling item. Okay. You got it all. And I'll say it all again when we get to it. Okay, because there, there were three pulled totally, then right. The 32, 35, and 54 pulled in their entire Five and seven separate votes. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, this takes us to our consent agenda. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any no, opposed? No. Hold on. One moment, Jeff. Hold on. Just trying to get it out. Yeah. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Beat me to it. Um, all right, now we get to what I just uh, mentioned to you. Um, we now will consider court orders I, um, I, 1 through 66 with addendum 67, 68, and 69, and also 70. But we are pulling 32, 35, and 54, and we're also pulling 5 and 7 for a separate vote on each of those. Is there a motion on what I've just... Yes, second. Get it all on the screen, please. I'm not making a motion. Somebody's got to make it. Oh, I thought that uh, Commissioner Garcia... Did, uh, I missed it. No, no, I haven't. Oh. Did I make it? So moved. And we'll wait for the computer, but while we're waiting, is there a second on that? Commissioner Price, 68 is your appointment, right? For the right. That is, that is my appointment. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Motion by District 1. Yes. yes. Commissioner Daniels. By District 3. Yes. That's correct. Is there any discussion before we vote on these items? 
I just want to make some comments, comments, Judge, if you allow me. Sure. On item number is number four, Fire Marshal de los Santos. I just want to, you know, congratulate you. I'm very proud of the fact, and as we talk about emergency personnel, the job that you did as well when the tornadoes happened, and the fact that this item, you know, gives you some of the leeway to upgrade the code in 2015, this commissioner's court, and I want to thank my colleagues. We upgraded the code for the first time in 25 years. And I want to thank also Mr. Bassan, Mr. Martin, and the whole team for bringing this forward. I'm looking forward to all the improvements that was going to happen on, uh, you know, in, this, in those areas that do not, you know, that the county oversees and us un unincorporated areas. And I think you have done a great job. I know Dr. Pepe has, know, has now joined the team and have worked with him in the past. You know, you have a great team. And I look forward to keep seeing those improvements and changes that are happening on incorporated areas. I know that we just got the second one, and I was very pleased to see the work that you're doing. So, well, I mean, I was trying to pretty much stay they far afar, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, <clears throat> you know, there seems to be, you know, it's one thing about God in revealing uh, Marshal De Los Santos, the tornado revealed some things that uh, were not on the radar. Uh, we had them on our, our maps, uh, but uh, they showed to be areas that were not populated. That's number one. Number two, subsequent to that, <clears throat> it appears as though um, when we thought we had to, we had basically taken care, ameliorated all of this doing well, back when we were doing the ETJ um, extraterritorial jurisdiction issues. Uh, it was Dallas County who took the leadership and ferreted out that program. Of course, we've gone back now and seen that we've had to go in and cities who didn't file the appropriate documentation, we, they've had to go back and amend it. And subsequently, um, this department is still in the discovery mode. So I guess what I'm saying, Ryan, and I, I know we, we talked about the dollars with one city, one of my cities, in, in terms of their designation. I'm, I'm even more concerned now with some discoveries that uh, the marshal has come up with lately and whether or not he's going to have the appropriate staff uh, to really begin to deal with that whole issue. It's one thing to talk about violations and permitting, but the more we uncover, the more we're out there, the more we're uncovering. And uh, I know we get, did we did an extra one person, uh, but I'm, I'm not so sure, and I guess you can speak to that as to whether or not you think uh, you're going to be. That's one of the things, uh, Judge Commissioners, is, you know, we are uncovering new boundaries out there, and uh, there, are, there are some uh, challenges that are coming out. They'll be coming out pretty soon with uh, some ETJ and uh, permitting processes, and we are going to probably, you know, I'm going to request for a uh, more staff to handle that. It's, it's, it's major. <clears throat> it's, it's not, you know, a rodeo or a race here and there and liability. No, this is, this is, this is major. And uh, we'll, before, hopefully before the week's out, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll know. I just want to kind of give you, give you a heads up. It's, it's, it's coming. Okay. And Fire Marshal is ready and uh, we appreciate it all the revenue also that you bring to Dallas County. Thank you. Thank Commissioner, uh, can I just one, one light to this whole uh, discussion here? Uh, you know, uh, we've been able to, to put together the permit and the ETJ information to provide, but it's with, uh, with our, our fire uh, marshal here, uh, the inspection portion has been lacking. Uh, mm -hmm. in the years that's and that's been really the problem mm -hmm. and therefore we I think we have the correct information pulled together through our DA and, and the information provided through our agreements but it's been very very difficult and working close with, at hand 
with our fire marshal has been very encouraging because he's been able to capture a lot of that that we've been unable to do because of that need to go out and and do the inspection that's necessary. Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not they're reading the master agreement. Uh, apparently, based on the latest uh, find, somebody's not reading the master agreement. And uh, I understand the fire marshal has approached them, and they basically said, county. <laughs> That's not what the master agreement says. So uh, the DA needs to get, you know, get into this loop with the marshal because at some point in time, we're going to have to start generating to these cities, you know, you're in violation of the master agreement, number one. And then the whole other process, we're going to have to figure out how to tag. Okay? But thank you for all your work as well, Ms. Blair. We appreciate it. Thank you, Marshal. Thank you. Tornado will reveal. Okay. Yeah, okay. Nothing else. Call the call the call the question. All right. Is there any further comments? Any further comments? Any further comments? I'll make uh, one comment, and this is uh, I, I hate to praise anybody because you, you're leaving out somebody, but I really appreciate it. I see every, and we got a lot of great departments here, but I see every week um, since Mr. Garza got here, uh, 10 or 12 this week, 12 orders um, on our uh, purchasing, and I just see a lot going on there in purchasing, and I appreciate the work that you and your uh, team and everyone over in purchasing is, is uh, uh, doing, so thanks for your work. Thank you, Judge. All right. And when we clean out the... I have a plan, sir. Okay. Clean out the... Warehouse. Ah. It, it, we, we're, we're overcome. Uh, we got, but, but again, we have a lot of great departments. Um, yep. But, you know, just wanted to single that out, out for this week. Um, all right. Uh, any further comments? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, and this takes us to Court Order 5, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, is there a motion on Court Order 5? So moved. I'll um, <coughs> second. Well, that sounds, that's a good omen for you because I'm probably going to vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> Come well, on we're up. we're thankful. <laughs> yeah. hey, please, the Court, my name is Jerry Alexander. I'm president of the Dallas Bar Association for 2016. With me is Lori Ann Bedino. She is the co-chair. Can you pull the mic a little yeah, closer to either, Yeah, there. No, just talk. She's the co-chair. No, I don't. Yeah, just for a lawyer, you're a little soft-spoken, so uh, project a little bit. I've been, I've been using this voice a little bit too much. Oh, recently. that's what it is. I understand yeah. that. Okay. Uh, Lorianne Bodino is here with me. She's the co-chair of the courthouse committee. Uh, the Dallas Bar Association would like to coordinate a project with Booker T., Washington Arts Magnet School to provide a mural on the walls that go in the hallway between George Allen parking garage and the George Allen courthouse. Uh, I use that all the time. Uh, the county has it in the budget already to clean it up. Once it's cleaned up, uh, I have raised private funds to have a mural painted on the walls by a professional artist and for him to supervise and work with the art department <coughs> magnet school uh, for them to paint one of the walls actually the most important wall the facing wall when you walk in uh, there will be no county funds involved in this project no Dallas bar funds will be involved in this project and this is sort of a, an experiment in a way uh, because if this looks good then we may come to you and say there's other walls I'm I don't want to say I'm an artsy person. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I see blank walls, and I can see some over there. I don't know. You know, maybe, uh, maybe as time goes on, uh, there will be more. But uh, we have some slides. Uh, there's, a, for instance, if you're looking there now, uh, this is the wall when people come in from the garage to, the, to George Allen. And once they get through those glass doors you see at the end where that person is standing, they go up the escalators. And the courthouse is beautiful. There's marble, and you go over to white. But from the parking garage to there, you, they walk through this, and uh, it doesn't create a good first impression. And a lot of people, that's the first impression they have of the courthouse. A lot of jurors use that. Uh, 
uh, a lot of a lot of litigants, and these are concepts uh, by the artist. As you can uh, as you can see, that would be the the commissioner's court on uh, uh, on that wall, and he's done a good job. And a lot of these these things are concepts, but they uh, they're chosen by the artist. He has to fit them on the on the panels. And if you'd run a uh, run a few more. Uh, this one would be on that long wall on the left. For instance, I'm not a big fan of the cows, but that's, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure, we'll, we'll figure <laughs> something out. But, but he liked it. He's, he's an artist. He's an artist because uh, that's a famous, actually it's a famous sculpture over by the convention center. Uh, and, he, and he likes it. But anyway, let's see the, let's see the next one. Uh, this would be my, actually my favorite wall. That's George Allen on the left, the George Allen courthouse in the middle there that's the that's actually the Greek goddess of justice the Romans knocked her off and put a blindfold on her and stood her up and put a scale in her hand but that's that's the original we liked her better and then old red if you can I've seen the color version of that that red brick will jump off that wall especially if we get some lighting uh, if we'll run one more this is a, a, a famous photograph taken by a friend of the artist it's the skyline uh, at flood stage. Mm -hmm. uh, he has permission from the artist. That's not going to be the photograph on there. He's going to paint that on that wall uh, once the wall is prepared, and it's going to look spectacular. Here's the, let's do the, this next one. Now this is the facing wall that will be done by the students, and when you're walking in, that's what you're going to see first. You won't see these things. You won't see these things on the side. That'll that'll grab you. The way that's going to work is the students are going to uh, pick some icons and draw them themselves and there's going to be a little contest to see which icons get on there. I'm for sure there's going to be a Pegasus because that's the mascot of the Arts Magnet High School. They talked to the school people about that. One of the donors wanted Parkland Hospital on there, and which is great because it's a jewel of the county, sure. and a lot of people recognize that. And then there's a bridge or what have you. We'll have a little contest for that. I've submitted with I submitted a letter uh, January 6th that outlined all of these things. I also submitted a letter from the head of the art department at Booker T and from uh, Bernadette Nuttall, a, a DISD trustee, who said they are very much in favor of the project. And the reason they're in favor of the project Besides, it, it you know something for the students to do. What they're trying to do at, at the school now is saying, okay, you're an artist, but you've got to make money sometime. Make being an artist. Well, one way to make money being an artist is to do a mural. We've got a nice, good professional muralist. He's going to take them through the process. The panels that will cover that wall, though, will be executed. Will be, they'll be working on them in their studio at the high school. They will not be down at the county, so there's no problem about you know something happening down there. Uh, and they will be taken from there and affixed to the wall. Uh, the artist will do the uh, overall concepts and and coordination to make sure the colors <coughs> match uh, and the and the scales match. Uh, and so I would move that uh, that this be uh, that this be approved. Lauren, do you want to say anything? I just wanted to add that. I'm also excited about the project, but I'll be working with the various county departments just to ensure um, and coordinate that the prep work will be completed so that the artist can begin his work and that the students can complete their portion before the end of the school year so they can get credit. So the timeline is this year? Oh, yes. T Timeline's this year, yeah. right? Right, Jonathan? Yeah. That's if we can get facilities and everyone coordinated to get the prep work done, the cleaning, the painting, the prepping on the walls, the lighting. Mostly just cleaning first before if, we can start. If um, if you do half as well on this project as you did on the central jury room uh, and holding your holding your position, I understood the arm wrestling that went on with that project. I want you to understand. Now I understand. Let me just tell you, and for those of you who haven't seen it, of course we'll see it later. It is just, it's, it's remarkable. We got a chance the other day through the public defender's office and some guests uh, to utilize it. And just the, the design and the access, uh, the flow, just unbelievable. Same room, just flip. Improved. Oh, 
severely improved. Improved, not the. Uh, well, also credit really needs to go to the facilities department. Oh, I know. I, I know. Who, who coordinated all the vendors? I mean, they worked tirelessly with they, everybody barking orders I, at them. And I know they did, but I also know about the, the arm wrestling on the design and uh, why we why did we want to flip the flip the room, etc. You know, and sometimes, you know, just got to give leadership courage. Well, you know, well, I mean, courage well, where, where the leadership is. Perseverance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more importantly, like Nike say, just do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Now, uh, now, around here, we just do a lot yeah, of stuff. Just I, do it, I mean, and don't wait another 25 yeah, years. Yeah. But with that being said, I just want to thank the Dallas Bar Association. This is exciting. This is good. It's a public private partnership, which makes us all proud. Uh, we're going to a remodeling of George Allen right now, so it was the perfect timing for this project. In my opinion, like Commissioner Price says, it always takes leadership from someone, and I know that you have been involved with the judge in making this. Of course, the fact that Booker T. Washington, one of our, you know, our schools, uh, are involved in this, a diverse, uh, you know, body of population. I mean, it, it's just a feel good. <coughs> You know, one of the projects that Dallas is known they're, for. They're, they're right up the street from our headquarters, a thousand steps away. And I've been trying, the Bar Association has been trying to get something, some project going with them. And finally, I went, well, you know, it's an arts magnet school. Why don't we do something arty? And they right. went, went down and went, wow, let's do this. Yes, and we've done it in other areas of the city. Bishop Arts is an example where people actually get pride on these murals. And hey, as a young artist, what a better point in your curriculum than say, hey, go and look to George Allen, how beautiful and how good I am. This will be a six weeks project and they will get it right. Thank you, Mr. Allen. It's a win win for everybody. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. I hope it turns out good. Oh, it will. It will. It will. And now Dallas has been voted one of the best. The concept here is like Fair Park, like our new little art. <laughs> I think it's going to be spectacular. Well said. And now we have the best. We've been voted one of the best skylines in the United States. And it is right there. Of course, I would like another shot coming from downtown into the south. And that's just to put some of the beautiful bridges that we will have. But that will be another project for the future. So with that, I, you know, with gusto, I move this side. You've already moved it. Mr. have already seconded it. Just okay. call the question. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank any you. further comments? Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank Congratulations. You. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Alexander. Thank, thank, thank you to the bar. Dallas Bar. I move court order seven. And we have a speaker on it. Second. All right. And um I think I was remiss when the last speaker came up, um, not recognizing that that was in fact a public speaker um, and didn't have us read the rules of de uh, decorum. So that was my oversight. Um, but but uh, please read our rules of decorum. All commissioners, court attendees are hereby advised that this meeting is conducted, conducted in accordance with Dallas County Code, Section 74 through 71. This is cause our signature speakers are to preserve <coughs> and decorum at all times. But never profane or slanderous remarks are not appropriate and will not be allowed at any time during this public meeting. Any and all applause is to be kept brief in observance of time constraints. Disruptive visitors and or registered speakers may be removed and are subject to the penalties provided in the state of Texas Penal Code sections 38, 13, 42, 01, and 42, 05. Registered individual speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes and the maximum discussion on any one topic is limited to 30 minutes. Thank you. And our first speaker on this topic potentially is uh, Mr. William Hopkins. Uh, Mr. William Hopkins. Yes, yes. Um, no, it's speaker on this project. No, it's she does the speaker rules. Okay. So I've got to assume that it is. Um, 
Go ahead, sir. Yeah, it's in another topic. Wait. Well, it says the speaker's rule. So, uh, are you speaking on this topic or a different topic, Mr. Hopkins? Uh, what topic are you all on? We are on the topic of the uh, frequency of our meetings and the rules um, on posting and briefing of items. Is that, a, is that the topic you wish to speak on, sir? Can I still speak at the end of the meeting? No. Yes, sir, you can. Uh, no, 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 you can speak no. one time, but the, if you're not speaking on that topic, you will need to speak at the end of the meeting. If you're speaking on court order number seven, which deals with the frequency of meetings, the posting of items, and the um, whether or not those items are briefed at a session before when they're voted on, now is the time to speak. If you're speaking on a different matter, at the end of the meeting is the time to speak. Because your subject is the speaker's rules and item number seven deals with um, rules, um, the court rules, um, I'm, at, I'm calling you up and asking you, is that what you're speaking about today or is it something different? If it's something different, that's fine. We just have to do it at the end. Uh, I guess we're going to uh, the rules, y'all rules. Okay. okay. Go, go ahead, sir. I think our rules is racist and uh, I used to speak down here every week and uh, I'd like to know how did y'all vote for uh, how, did, how do you, how do, you uh, do these rules how do uh, blacks not get to speak and nobody say nothing. Uh, I don't know where y'all got that written in y'all rules where y'all don't have to say nothing to the public speakers. I think that's another racist. I, I like I like to know who wrote that and was the person that wrote these rules. I would like to know the person that wrote these rules. Is, is, are they a member of the Aryan Nation Ku Klux Klan? Thank you. Um, our next speaker on this topic um, our last speaker on this topic is, is Ms. Kim Morris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The last time I was here about this topic, I had a prepared speech. This time I don't. I just wanted to say, well, Happy New Year to you all. It's good to see you all. And uh, Dr. Uh, your address. Oh, I'm sorry. Kim Morris, 2643 Toronto Boulevard, Irving, Texas, 75038. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Your staff has been very kind to me about keeping me um, abreast of what is uh, the time that this will be discussed. So, uh, Mr. Rios, who I've never met, I want to yes, thank right him here. very much for his work with me. Um, on this particular topic, I just want to bring up again, not having read the um, study that was done, but I do want to bring up to you again that I hope there was a good basis a financial basis that you're starting from so the information is from a financial point of view also um, I also want to bring up to you uh, to you all that I did not elect your staff they were not on the ballot you all were so when you're considering this um, anything that brings the public to you frequently is beneficial in this county we're a very large county you have a lot to discuss all the time I deal with your staff uh, multiple times, and I think they're wonderful, but I feel that the public needs to be heard more frequently. So whatever the finances are of this study, which I look forward to hearing, um, that there is a good basis, there's a good comparison, and that we understand clearly what those numbers are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris. All right. Um. Are there comments on this um, court item from members of the court? Or would the staff like to, I saw the staff had, had uh, briefed this item and had some opinions about this item. Um, the staff want to lay anything out? And if not, are there any comment? Or first of all, the staff want to lay anything out? I think the, the briefing is very clear. Mr. Heichel has done an excellent job putting the information together. I don't know if he had any other comments to it, but I don't I think the briefing itself is really Speaks clear. Right. Are there com comments from the court? 
I'd like to make a few comments then, if I might. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I know that everybody in this room and everybody in Dallas County wants to see the county do the absolute best that it can and to see improvement in, in areas that we can make improvements. I also appreciate the, the efforts by, by the Dallas County staff because that's one of the things that they always have forefront in their mind of how can we do a better service in what we do. Uh, when we originally had talked about this at, at, from this position and publicly, there were a, a number of factors that I thought should be taken into account uh, when making a decision about the frequency of meetings. I wondered, I wanted to look at first of all what is public access because yes we are a representative government and that that is a, a critical piece of, of how we do business. Secondly, what would be the impact on the, on the staff? Recognizing, too, we've got over 6,000 members in our staff, so that's a, a rather broad question. In looking at and just collecting information of what has happened over the, during this pilot project, um, I just made a little chart of, of where I thought that we're making improvements and where maybe we're falling a little bit short yet. Uh, for example, um, in providing access of the public to the information that goes on in these meetings, which is the material available to the public, definitely I think it is an improvement to say that we now have materials av available approximately 12 days for most of the information. I mean, that's an improvement so that there's more time to, uh, to analyze. Versus. Versus three. Versus three. Right. No, absolutely, that is an improvement. Okay. Um, on public access, uh, even though I know that there is an accounting of the number of people who have signed up to talk in front of the court during this pilot project, I don't think it can be denied that we have halved the amount of minutes that the public has of our undivided attention. If there were four meetings in a month that a person could conceivably have 12 minutes of contact, um, but that with only two minute, only two meetings, then you have that to six minutes. Um, it is an advantage that of the materials that are presented that everything has a briefing so that it's not just a title of something, but that there's information so that, uh, that the, everybody, public staff, us, can make an assessment of what is the specific order talking about, um, and what are the issues, and you know, uh, to, in order to formulate an opinion about, about that particular item. So that also is an advantage. There is a section on the cost savings um, and even though I appreciate the, that, that being put in there and seeing that how everyone, how all of staff uses their time makes a difference, and in one essence, yes, there is a, the court doesn't, not as much money would be spent on court per se, on court meetings, but I would contend that those funds are being spent regardless because as a staffed person, you're going to, uh, receive your salary or you're as an elected official you'll receive your salary so that I saw that as a you know plus minus maybe you could be spending staff could be spending their time in different areas but is that really a cost savings well not so much because it's been it's going to be spent which is how is it going to be spent I really wanted to talk a little bit, though, about the impact of what this has meant to the variety of people, uh, and staff is the, is the primary uh, set of, of people here. Um, I think the original intent was that the Commissioner of Court Administrative Staff and that the directors were the ones that were targeted as far as how their time is spent and the number of hours that they have to spend in putting together the agenda items, uh, doing the briefings and all of those kinds of things. Um, and I would, I would agree that if you're, uh, if you're only doing it every other week instead of every other week that that you, that those persons then would be able to dedicate those hours to, 
two other responsibilities. Uh, in looking at the number of orders that are included from moving in this pilot uh, time period from uh, four meetings a month or, uh, to two meetings a month, um, the number of orders obviously have increased because the amount of work that the county does d hasn't changed. Uh, so that it's been just the, the time distribution has been different. And just a number of conversations with a lot of other staff members of Dallas County, though, a number of items have been brought to my attention where that their work has been impacted in at least three different areas that I have been aware of. And that is, for example, in purchasing and reimbursement and in weekly paychecks, where oftentimes through no act of their own, for example, if you would miss the deadline of Wednesday at 4 o'clock to have an item put on the agenda, um, that, you, that there would then be an additional delay of that next two-week period. Um, that people may say that it's a, pl it's a planning issue. Well, sometimes you plan as well as you can, but you don't have total control over, over everything. And so I have been informed of, of situations where either in purchasing an item was, was needed and, they, and thus the purchasing of that item was delayed due to the, uh, the timing of the meetings. A person had uh, spent their own funds on something, uh, travel, a number of other things, and reimbursement had been <coughs> paid. Um, it also had been stopped by a, by a constituent there, uh, an attorney who is appointed, and they had been um, inconvenienced <coughs> because of the delay in the payments to them. These are not life or death situations, I would, I would imagine, but they have to be planned for. There has to be a procedure that's put into place to address, um, to control the impact of, of those of those kinds of situations. But I saw that as an area that sometimes you don't really know what you're getting into until you're into it, and then you see the unintended consequences of, of your actions. And I have absolute full confidence that the talent of our staff will be able to figure this out. At the moment, I'm not sure that we've totally reached that point. Um, so I would say at this point that we need to um, to review those procedures, review policies that we have in order to minimize the the negative impacts of what this might have in the three areas that I've mentioned, and that's to develop those those policies and procedures, and then to to talk among all of the staff so that we're very aware and can do that adequate planning. Um, so at this moment, I would say that the order, as much as I admire the efforts to let's keep Dallas County moving forward and improving, that this is incomplete, that uh, these, these policies and procedures need to be um, worked on just a little bit more, and I be, am very, very willing to do whatever I can in that, in that moving forward. Uh, at the time, I will, I will be voting no on this, though. Appreciate my colleagues' struggle to try to get to here. The public has signed up less since the implementation of this policy, according to the county clerk's office. <clears throat> the court orders have basically been the same, whether you put them on every week or every two weeks. The process operationally has been the same. While this court was in recess, some of us had to sign documents up to $4 million, $9 million, and get this court to ratify it. Operationally, whether you're talking about checks to vendors, or, we do that all the time. Operationally, there is a process. That's the reason we've got an executive auditor that does not report to this court. And if you talk to him, which we have, with regards to this process, I think it was your opinion that this process gives less stress 
and, and creates an easier process on your department, which does all the accounts payable, receivable, for this county. Is that correct? Okay. And so some of, we've talked to them. We've talked to the users of the system, people who are working here every day, regardless of whether this court meets or does not meet. Operationally, they say it works more effectively. It's less stress on the staff. And so some of us have been querying staff outside of our staff to find out how, it's, how, the, how the counties operate. So this whole thing of ratification, operation, being able to speak, they still have the same. The only thing that has basically changed, other than being able to, to probably so, some compensation, is the fact that they got the same court orders and people are speaking less. And we pull those, we pull those from the uh, county clerk's office. So instead of having three days, they now have 12, and they're still not signing up for specific or specifically on court orders. If you check the county clerk's office, 90% of the speakers have nothing to do with the business of the county. They've come down, they have not spoken on any, for the most part, on any of the court orders. And that's according, and we, you know, we're, we're pulling that information. So they're not, they're, they're coming and they're speaking on matters of which most of the time this court has no jurisdiction whatsoever. To continue to talk about some of the speakers come down and says we can't respond to them. We can't respond to them because the, the district attorney has told us we can't respond. It's not a matter that is on the agenda specifically. And if it's not posted, we can't respond. That's what we've been told. We've been advised. But matters that are on the agenda, we can respond. They have spoken. Ninety percent of the speakers have not spoken on matters that are indicative to our agendas. So. And purchase, yeah. Same thing. Is that correct, Mr. Garza? That is correct. Okay. So both Mr. Thomas, the auditor, CPA, says that. Mr. Garza, the purchasing agent, says that. These are the people who are operating the day-to-day -day operations of this county. Accounts receivable, accounts payable. They're, they're the ones. And, and, and when this court is not in session and decisions have to be made, staff makes it, one of us deals with it, and y'all come back and ratify it. That's the way, we, that's the way we've always done this. I'll yield. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Well, you know, uh, first of all, thank you, Ms. Morris, for being here. We always appreciate when people in the community come and, you know, say what they want to say, because this is your court, your commissioner's court. And let me start by saying that I was one of the reluctant commissioners when this idea came from Mr. Martin's office. What? We're going to have less meetings? You know, what will happen? What will be the procedure? How are we going to make it effective? So, hey. I just thought that the scientific method would be the best way to explain my points today. Because like Mr. Martin said, the briefing is, you know, very well to point. So the first thing about the scientific method is to ask the question, why, you know, are we doing this? You know, why we're not aligned with about another 20 counties that already do this. Mr. Garza, you come from a county and in the past you talk about, it, you know, the fact that you appreciate having more time for do some of the proceedings. You know, we did the background check, uh, you know, and the background and the hypothesis was that public will not be fully aware of what's going on in the commissioner's court. The transparency will be affected. There will not be savings unless people will come and get involved. You know, then we went for the pilot. And the reason I moved and approved the pilot was because I wanted to know, hey, if we can be more effective, continue to manage well, because the county has a good track record, you know, we're transparent, and we have more speakers, why not? Let's have the <coughs> hypothesis, you know, you know, tested. So we went from a pilot, and I, and I voted for it from October 6 till December 19, which is six meetings. Okay, what happened since then? 
you know, analyzing what happened uh, the nine months before the pilot, we have an average of three to four speakers. During the pilot, we have an average of 11 speakers per meeting. Well, that goes to say that people did get engaged into the issues. You know, so what are the results? You know, we talk about it. One of the things was, and I know that this is not the most important part, but as a business owner, I always have to look into this. You know, what is the cost of doing these pilots? What is the cost that comes to this court? You know, an annual cost of the yearly meeting is around $504,000. If, and we talk about the Hay study, you know, just two weeks ago, and how we want to increase pace for our employees that are still 15 below percent, the 80 mark, you know, these are, these will be savings of around 204, and of course, I understand, and before Mr. Brown tells me, you know, sometimes it can be a soft cost. After all, this was just a pilot. But there's savings, guys, on this. So, if you just follow what we did, the results are, you know, public input did not go down. You know, more people came. Therefore, transparency was included. You know, we have the same efficiency. We continue to manage, and we have a cost savings. So, following the scientific method, you know, it worked, guys. The pilot worked. So. Uh, I also have the opportunity, I know that there were different organizations that came in the past and gave their input, and I want to thank uh, Susie Bell uh, Goldsbeek with the League of Women Voters as well as the chair, uh, Eileen Rosblum. We have a very good discussion about what can we do to increase, you know, participation of our constituents in Dallas County. And uh, we decided, and thanks to Mr. Martin and his staff, you know, one of the issues is, you know, how do we make people aware and engage them with us? So after the meeting, we decided that obviously we need to do something in our website, which right now our front page on the website is going through development and new redesign. And Mr. Martin, please stop me if I put my shoe in my mouth. And, um, and it's a great opportunity to go ahead and emphasize and uh, underline and more, make more obvious, you know, how to sign up. You know, sometimes people can be confused on when you drive through our website. And we are working, and it's already on a more visible and more um, uh, flashy for saying something, Mr. Martin. How right. would you describe it? Right, right. It's just uh, more visible. It, made it points bolder. out to everybody that checks our agenda on how to get faster, how to sign up, and how to be here. And of course, the most important thing, you know, is that, you know, people don't have 72 hours. Guys, in the past, before the pilot, we get the agenda on Friday, I'm reading it on Saturday, I'm asking questions on Sunday and Monday, and I'm voting on Tuesday. Now, you know, you have 285 hours. I find out personally, and I want to say this from Elba Garcia, is that I'm reading now the agenda more than one time before I'm voting. I find myself saying, did I read that right? Let me ask again. Let me talk to my colleagues. So in my opinion, the pilot has worked and not only has given us the opportunity to have more contact with our community. We're also discussing some ideas about putting our calendars and a website link with the League of Women Voters. We're working with our IT guide so they can see it in different computers as well as uh, Spanish media to have it in the Calendario Comunitario. You know, how can we make it better? Because it's easy to say this doesn't work or this works, but in my opinion it's also how can you always make it better? And this gives us an opportunity of making it better. And um, like I say, uh, I was very long time when I voted for the pilot. I have my doubts, but I also call staff. I also call some of the people that make the decisions with Dallas County, and I haven't heard one of them telling me, Dr. Garcia, I didn't like having more time to make the decisions that I will present to court. So with that, colleagues, I will be supporting the item. I believe that just following what happened and following the briefing, 
it has worked. I, con I continue to look forward to working with new ideas, new way of doing things in Dallas County, and this is one that is not out of alignment with what other big counties, you know, are doing today. And if it's better management, efficiency, transparency, and cost, hey, we have a winner. Thank you. Mr. Cantrell? Yep. Um, no, my, my opinions on this are, are well known. I would like to, to uh, uh, say a few things. Uh, with respect to our staff, uh, we've got a, a great staff, and similar to the staff of all of our partners, I, I don't doubt that our staff prefers less meeting, less public uh, questioning, and less public answers, and less work. I think that is true of any staff at any city, any of our federal partners, or any of our state partners. Uh, these meetings can can be difficult um, on staff and on elected officials because uh, the public that speaks is normally speaking about things that they have concerns about or disagree with us uh, with the majority on. The reporters that cover uh, public meetings typically write stories about things that are not unanimous and that can be controversial. Uh, and so it is easier for staff to work with less public meetings. Uh, that is not what I base my uh, decision on uh, as to how I vote. I, I don't find the briefing, I do find the briefing to be um, well written, as I would expect from a good lawyer uh, like Gordon Heichel. Um, I think it is what we as lawyers call argument or persuasion, no, not scientific. Scientific would take into account um, all of the the uh, information and uh, would be something that is is a validated um, study. Uh, this rather takes um, uh, is a is a good uh, persuasive argument for one side. Um, the the uh, first section of the argument is that the uh, answering a, a, what we in law, in law call a hypothetical question or a straw man question of the public will not be fully informed about actions being taken by their elected officials. I think a better question for us to answer is, is the public as fully informed as they were under our previous rules? The big change here is that we still have, as we've always had, 288 hours from the time something appears in, in your book and is posted until the time that it is ultimately voted on by this court. We have removed one meeting and we've removed the public briefing uh, b the week before we vote. And so now we still have 288 hours before non-emergency items are voted on, but we don't have the public briefing. Um, the public briefing served as an opportunity for the public, the few members of the public who wish to come to our meetings, and the broader public who got their information from news sources um, to learn about what the county was doing with their tax dollars and with their quality of life issues. Um, I think when we look at transparency, I've heard um, discussions about transparency, and I think everyone here is an honest person who is trying to do their best. But, but when we think about public transparency, we have to think about it from the standpoint of the public, not from the standpoint of the members of the court or the staff. Uh, it is true that any member of the court can pull any item with the agreement of their uh, court members um, for a two-week period. But that is not the same thing as the public being fully briefed on items the week before they're voted on. And so I have to take um, my cues in listening to how the public feels about that change from the public. And in this instance, um, I, don't need to, I don't draw inferences from the number of people that sign up to speak. I'm listening to every speaker who did sign up to speak. As you pointed out, there were a lot, but everyone who spoke on this topic spoke 
uh, against this change. Not a single person came to say they favored this change. Um, the League of Women Voters, uh, one of the speakers, took a vote, I believe it was a unanimous <coughs> vote, that they opposed this change. Every news organization that covers this court uh, that opined on this issue, not just through their coverage, but through editorializing, which includes, and I'm, I'm maybe leaving some out, but I know the Dallas Morning News, WFAA, and the Dallas Observer, um, all uh, did uh, forms of opinion pieces or editorials opposing this change. Not a single person in either an email or a phone call um, to my court or any of the joint or to my to my email or to any of the joint emails that we were all copied on uh, said they were in favor of this change um, so that that to me is the transparency we look at not our transparency staff transparency or elected transparency but public transparency um, last on the cost savings um, the the, um, the the briefing is honest in that it says that the, that there's not an attempt to determine the task of capturing the monetary cost. It says without attempting the indeterminate task of capturing the monetary cost of preparing for each court meeting, but rather in an attempt to reflect average cost for the top 50 county officials. Um, let's remember, and this includes appointed and elected. Let's remember that our top 50 county officials are salaried employees. So whether or not they are going to the meetings or they are in their office or they are at home, um, during, they, they are going to receive the same salary. And if um, keeping the public informed requires our highest paid employees, these top 50 highest paid employees, um, for instance, those of us up on the dais um, are all paid over $150,000 a year uh, to do our jobs. And um, if that requires us to work a, a little bit more... One is. No, I believe you're all, when you consider your car allowances and all that, I believe you're all paid well over $150,000. Um, um, uh, at any rate, the vast majority of these top 50 are paid over $100,000, and they're all salary. And um, if it means that we have to spend a little bit more time, and I, I'm, I'm, I understand I've got a small child, and, uh, but if it means we spend a little bit more time, we spend a little bit more time because um, this is public service, and it's, uh, we've got to be, um, have our, our hand on the pulse of the public, and if the pu public doesn't feel that we're transparent, um, then we're, I think we're losing a, a great deal. And in this instance, the public um, has overwhelmingly informed us that they do not favor this change. And for those reasons, uh, I'll be voting no. You know, it's just hard not to, you know, all this pandering. Look, let me tell you something. Some of us are here. We sleep here. We sleep here seven days a week. And, 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 to, and, and, and to even infer, I think staff will tell you, and we, we call them. We call them at night. We call them at 5 o'clock in the morning. What are you talking about, Judge? I mean, I just all I'm saying is, is that we are accessible. And I, and I put mine up because I mean, nobody's more accessible here for staff or anybody else. I mean, where's our constituents on Sunday, Sunday nights? Come on, Judge. I mean, don't don't do that to staff and or us. The, the fact of the matter is, we're just talking about some operational efficiencies here. We're still here, and I both and both of you have talked about more speakers. But ninety percent of the speakers have not been on topics that's on the agenda. It may be, you know. I mean, I understand the Big Dipper is is is, is, is turned or the North Star, but if that's what they want to talk about, that's fine. We give them that time, but we can't. We we can't be conversant with them. But on matters that are on this docket, no more have spoken since we've gone to this than it did before. It was it, it's almost the same. So we go and pull those numbers. So I mean that that's you know talk about 
and, and I know you don't mean to be disingenuous, but I mean that pandering. It's just, just that's just not it, Judge. We work hard. We work hard. We're accessible. We, we're accessible to our public. We take all our telephone calls. We return them even when we pretty much know what some of them are going to say. But I'm just saying, don't don't infer that that either staff doesn't, you know, or or, or we don't work seven days a week. That's 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 not right. Uh, Commissioner, and let me say to my colleagues, I'm not inferring um, that any person doesn't work. I think the briefing speaks for itself that there's obviously less work for people in meeting half as many meetings as there is in meeting twice as many meetings. Um, no, that's stage. That's just posture. That's, we sit up here. We still, we still take it. We still doing the same amount of work. It's, 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 it's nothing. You know, we're just not sitting here posting up for right. people. Then, then if that's the case, then, then we're not. You, you agree with me that we're not saving costs by the salaried employees sitting here. Yeah. Um, I think, I think what's fair to say is we're, no one's going to change each other's uh, minds here. Okay. Uh, Call today. the question in. Okay. All right. Okay. Then the question has been called. Are there any further uh, comments on the on the matter? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Uh, motion carries three. Yeah, voted no. Oh, I definitely voted no. Yeah. Yes, yes, I hit, yes, yes, you know button. what? I hit the yay button. Well, that's all right. We, we understand. We understand. <laughs> the conscience hit the right button. Now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. That's all right. The, his yeah, conscience hit the right button. He hit. Yeah. His mouth says something else. Okay. Says you hit the right button. All right. All right. Now this Thank takes you for us to. Thank you um, I believe our briefing. Session and um, discussion session. That's not there. Yeah. All right, let's go back. Unless there's uh, Daryl, is there any presentation of any type? We've already covered that. I think yeah, that's it. We have right. the speakers. We so have three speakers left. We've got uh, some speakers left. We've already read our rules of decorum. Uh, I'm going to call our next speaker, Miss Laura Jenkins. Miss Laura Jenkins. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Speak on matters or Uncle Miss Jenkins is coming. I just want to say, we mentioned it already before, but the Crawley Central Jury, uh, jury Room Project update is already done. And we have the opening, Mr. Martin. Yes, we do. Which is, will be um, today, today uh, at, at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock in the Central Jury Room. And I want to thank officially and with big kudos to Jonathan Bassan and the jury services for bringing this uh, forward. It was needed, you know, and facilities, of course, it was needed. We needed better, uh, you know, uh, management efficiency and cost was included in this. And I always say that's the best thing about this job. And, and public service, Steve Miser's group also yeah. were very integral in making this happen. Yes, so. definitely. Thank you, Mr. Bassan. Mm. 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 Give your name for the mm. give your name for the record and your address. And your three I'm <coughs> Laura Jenkins, 8101 Canyon Oak Drive, North Richmond Hills, Texas. And thank you much. Thank you so much for having this this opportunity. As I've stated previously, in 2005, my son was found guilty of intoxication manslaughter, and the 2004 death of the Great Brown Police Officer Darren Mellon. Without Diminishing our remorse for this family, our son was not intoxicated, not drunk driving, but had an epilepsy seizure. He has completed 10 years of his 12 and a half year sentence, denied parole four times. He's up for parole again now. Please go to my son's website, justiceforwardreen.com, where we have this case documented. And just to clarify why I'm here and to let you know that you're not the only place that I show up, I go to the Tarrant County Commissioner's Court I go to the Ulysses City Council because that's where the police officer worked. I go to the Grapevine City Council because that's where Officer Darrell and worked. I'm here because this forum allows me to have an opportunity to share what the Dallas FBI has done and that we went to them to have justice. We went to them because 
we knew that the police officer who interacted with my son had, she testified that she had turned off her video. We have affidavits to prove that she tampered the video. And we knew that the Tarrant County District Attorney had changed the blood draw process and had it taken to the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office. And the blood draw shows up at .11. So we took all of that to the FBI, and just over the last year and a half that I've been talking about this story, and specifically in the last six months, it finally hit me that indeed it is the Dallas FBI that determined what happened in my son's case when I went to Department of Justice, because everybody referred back to the Dallas FBI. And the Dallas FBI and the Tarrant County ME office have a relationship that goes back, all the way back to Waco, with Dr. Pirawani, who happens to say that he worked with the Dallas FBI. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Justiceforroyjr.com, please go to that website. And I will continue to use every form that is available to me, including I, I do 5Ks with my sign. I do, uh, I, I, I just take every opportunity I can to say, I'm here for justice for my son. And I'm here because the Dallas FBI has decided that my son, uh, whatever the work they're supposed to do, they cannot do it for my son. So thank you so much. Uh, our, our next speaker is um, Mr. Jeff Hood. <laughs> My name is Reverend Dr. Jeff Hood. I live at 2723. North Crest Road in Denton, Texas, 76209. I'm here today to speak uh, on behalf of the Joseph Hutchison family, uh, who on August the 1st, 2015, around 10 a.m., parked his truck on the curb at the Luce Starrett Justice Center in Dallas County and hysterically ran inside. He ran up the hill and entered the lobby. Upon entering the lobby, he screamed, I just need some help. Please don't hurt me. According to the Dallas Morning News, and now a videotape, deputies at the Dallas County Sheriff's Department pounced on Mr. Hutchison, one with a knee to the back, one with a knee to the neck that turned into a knee to the throat. The last time that I spoke to you all, we only knew about those things from eyewitness accounts. Now we know about these things from a videotape that has shown that these things happened. After Mr. Hutchison went unconscious, there was an extended period of time where Mr. Hutchison did not receive medical attention. And so whether the Dallas County Sheriff's Department is guilty of killing Mr. Hutchison by placing the knee to the back and the knee to the throat, or whether they're guilty of killing Mr. Hutchison from failing to render medical aid quickly, what we know from the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office is that this was a homicide. Usually in homicides, we get to know who the police are pursuing as the culprit in the homicide. We get to know who the police are investigating, who's the suspect. In this case, we are going on close to six months since this happened, and we have no idea who these deputies were. Every time that the citizens of Dallas County enter that lobby, they have no idea who they are encountering. I can tell you that I don't want my wife and children or anyone that I love, or for that matter, any citizen, getting a pat down 
from someone whose hands and knee led to the death of Joseph Hutchison. How are we as activists, how are we as the public supposed to keep up with incidences of police brutality when we don't know the names of the perpetrators? I ask for your help. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. All right. And I believe that concludes our public speakers. Um, oh, I bet. I, no, I, I, no. No, that's right. You've already spoken. Um, no, no, you said no. I said you could speak at the at the beginning or at the end. If you were speaking on the matter that was before the court, um, you could speak at that time. All right. All right. So that. Yeah. Mr. Hopkins, oh, you yeah, with okay. Go, go. Mr. Hop, Mr. Hopkins, if you have have further questions. Now, hang on a second, officers. No, if you have fur further qu yeah. questions, hey, well, ask after court. Harass me all the time. All right. and I'm scared he might kill me. Mr. Hopkins, to Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Hopkins, right please be seated. Okay. Thank you. All right, and and officers, I appreciate y'all uh, doing the job we had. All right. Um, all right. So we're going to take a. a, a, a about a three-minute break, and then we're going to begin a uh, closed session. Uh, we're, we're, uh, as authorized by Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, as previously posted, any action as a result of the closed session will take place in a subsequent open session. We'll begin our closed session in two or three minutes. People, chance to
All right, and the court will no action necessary as per the closed session. Court stands adjourned.